afternoon. My name is Jenny Faubert, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Career Education Review. I'd like to thank you today for joining us for our fourth webinar with Richard and Layton on Document Retention Best, best Practices for Post-Secondary Institutions. Um, I don't want to take too much time in the beginning, um, but I'll just cover a little bit about Career Education Review. Uh, we are an 88 year history publication providing information to the career education community. We publish twice a month and strive to be the source of news, best practices, ideas, commentary for the sector. We do cover a wide range of topics including op school operations, student retention, public policy, compliance, and curriculum. Uh, we're excited. Um, in upcoming issue, we are going to debut a new feature um, that will be in our News and Opinion Digest that we're calling Ask the Experts. Uh, we've got probably about 36 um, top ex experts in the career education community uh, field that we're really excited to have on our panel and they've agreed to share their knowledge with you, our subscribers. Um, if you're not a subscriber and are interested in becoming a subscriber to Career Education Review, uh, please just email me or give me a call and I can give you any information that you need. Now, to answer a few questions before we start, uh, we will be recording the webinar, which will be available on the Career Education Review website along with the PDF of the webinar. Uh, you will receive an email tomorrow with this, uh, with this information. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please send me a message through the chat or question function, and I will try to help you with the issue. Also, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question feature, and we will save 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, at this time, I would normally tell you about our next webinar. We will be taking a short break, um, and I will definitely email everyone with our next webinar information. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben and Ashi to start the pres presentation. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, my name is Ben Walker. I'm an attorney with Richard and Layton. Um, I've been uh, working in the Title IV field for going on nine years now. Um, do a lot of work uh, with clients involving compliance reviews, litigation, um, internal investigations, criminal defense, uh, and really all aspects of, of Title IV administration. Hi, I'm Ashi Marotra. I've been with, with Richard and Layton coming up on almost four years, and I work in the same area as, as Ben, uh, primarily with a focus on litigation. And so we're going to go ahead and get started with this webinar, uh, which is a document retention, best practices for post-secondary institutions. Uh, we'll start out with the disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed in this web webinar and its accompanying materials are those of the speakers, uh, Ashi and myself, and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of career education review. And the contents of this presentation and its accompanying materials do not constitute legal or regulatory advice. No one should act or refrain from acting on the basis of this webinar without seeking individualized professional counsel as may be appropriate. Uh, what's the purpose of this webinar? Uh, really, it's to, to, get, um, to get you all thinking about why you should care about data retention. And I thought an interesting fact was that according to the International Data Corporation, uh, humans will create uh, 1,800 1, new exabytes of data this year alone. And one exabyte is uh, roughly the equivalent of 50,000 years of continuously running movies. Uh, so just a, really an enormous volume of information. And, and really the, the more important question I think is, uh, does your organization need to retain every piece of data it creates? And, and I think based on my experience, the answer is no. And, um, and we're going to go through some discussion that, that hopefully gets you thinking a little more critically, critically about what data you need to keep and what data you can let go of. And uh, I know some clients have, have felt a pretty liberating feeling when they've gotten rid of stuff. It's been clogging up their network systems, it's been clogging up their servers, and uh, their IT department certainly appreciates it. And I think in the end, you know, they feel better when they've, they've instituted some practices and procedures that, 
prevents them from just keeping everything. Um, uh, document retention, certainly a focus for government investigations. And that's going to involve the Department of Education. Uh, it could involve uh, its Office of Inspector General or OIG. And increasingly, we're seeing you know, an involvement of the Department of Justice, um, particularly in the, in the False Claims Act claim um, and, and litigation cases. That's when the DOJ tends to get particularly involved. Um, it's certainly a focus for litigation, uh, and that's from plaintiff's counsel. And an important consideration is, is you know, increasingly we're seeing uh, attempts to manufacture cases that, that are based on documents that have, you know, based upon document preservation or lack thereof. Um, and, and what we mean by that is uh, either everything's been retained so everything can be searched and hopefully they'll find that smoking gun or nothing's been retained that should have been retained. And then the argument goes, well, if you had retained it, it would show that you violated the rule of regulation. And so it, it becomes a really Hobbesian choice uh, as, to, as to whether you want to um, uh, face them on the fact that you've, you've kept everything or you've kept nothing. And, and really what you want to do is strike a good balance and keep what you need to keep and get rid of what you don't need to keep. And if you can find that, that balance, which is a difficult thing to do, admittedly, um, it'll, it'll lower your costs. Um, it should give you a, a great deal of peace of mind um, that, you know, in terms of we've got what we need to have and we've got rid of everything else. And, and so um, we're not going to have to worry about what might have happened, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago that might be sitting there in our data. Um, and the other question, big, big question is can you manage the volume of data you do want to retain? And some consideration on that point are, are what software is required in terms of a data backup or a data archiving mechanism. Um, what sort of hardware do you need? And increasingly the hardware, uh, you know, in terms of server space or, or just raw storage space, it's getting cheaper, but it's still not zero. And once you have, if you have a larger organization or, or have a long um, history with a lot of data that you've kept over the years, it could really start to be a problem from a hardware perspective. It becomes increasingly hard to manage that and continually having to add new, new uh, capacity um, can, can really um, um, impact the bottom line. And, and right along with that is your manpower. You know, how many IT people do you need to really effectively manage your software and hardware? Um, most, uh, most institutions have a dedicated IT person, but once you're really keeping a, a huge volume of data, you know, you tend to have to add to that staff. And uh, so you want to consider, you know, do, is the staff that we have meeting our needs? Do we need to add more? Um, and, you know, is there a way that we can cut down on the data we are keeping so that we don't have to add new, new IT staff to manage it. Um, you know, who's going to typically require your data to be retained? I guess first and foremost for, for most uh, uh, Title IV participants is the U.S. Department of Education. And generally speaking, uh, they want you to keep your FA records. And that's going to include information that supports your disbursement of Title IV funds. But importantly, they don't obligate you to keep that forever. Um, the FSA handbook uh, has some pretty good guidance on what needs to be kept and for how long. Uh, it gives a pretty decent overview of the regulatory requirements. Um, you can certainly go directly to the regulations, but, but I, would, um, I would certainly encourage everybody to check the handbook and, and, and then look at what the department's guidance says. Um, you know, generally speaking, I would say the, the rule is three years after the award, the award year in which the aid was dispersed. You need to keep the supporting documentation. So that would mean keeping things like uh, your verification worksheets, your ICERs, your R2T4 calculations, all that good stuff. But once that period of time expires, um, the question really becomes, do you need to keep it? And the Department of Education, I think, would say generally no. Um, we don't require it. There are some certain special considerations on whether it's loan data or grant data or things like that. And the handbook will, will walk you through that pretty well. Um, who else requires data to be retained? Your crediting agency typically will as well. Um, and I think, you know, one of the ones that, that they tend to stress is, is academic records, which generally need to be kept pretty much in perpetuity. And, and I'd certainly urge you to check what your accrediting agency requires you to keep and how long they require you to keep it. They vary by agency, of course. And I'd also encourage everybody to look at how they require you maintain it um, in terms of having sufficient data backups and redundancy and on, on your hard copy data. Uh, are you keeping that in your fireproof cabinet, uh, in a secure location, and that kind of thing? Because increasingly what we see is uh, when, when you, uh, those agencies come out for a visit, for a review, 
if they don't find that and you can't prove you're keeping your data the way they require you to, they're going to make a finding about it and you're going to have to, to answer for it. And really the better thing to do is to get ahead of it and, and you know, demonstrate uh, uh, your compliance and, and your adherence to their standards by just doing what they ask you to do. Um, who else requires data to be retained? Sometimes your state licensing agency. I haven't seen that quite as much myself, but you know, I know, um, you know there are certainly some state agencies that they require you to keep certain things in certain forms. And, and again, just check uh, what the period of time is you're required to keep things. Um, and and the, the final requirement for, for data being retained is the institution itself. And, and when you're thinking about that, think about um, your own self-imposed policies and procedures, and that includes officially and unofficially. And, and what I mean by that is um, there might be something that you have in your, um, your handbook or a manual that you use or in a memorandum or something like that, that that explains what the policy is for keeping that information. But that may well differ from what the actual practice is. Um, and so really what you need to do is make sure that, that you can marry those two up and, uh, and, and make sure that, that what you say you're doing, you really are doing. And that if the policy says we keep it for five years, uh, the unofficial policy is that, delete, that it gets deleted after, you know, three and a half years. Um, or kept, you know, your policy is we keep it for five years and you destroy it. And really everything gets kept forever because um, of the, you know, the, the desire to not lose something. You know, there's sort of that, um, that, that unwillingness to let go. And, and as I said earlier, it can be pretty liberating to start letting that stuff go. Uh, what types of data are we talking about? Uh, generally speaking, most schools are, are going to maintain uh, your electronic records, which would include your network data, stuff that you keep on, on your network that, that your staff uses on a daily basis. And that's stuff like your Word documents, your Excel spreadsheets, your PDFs, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, your email records. Um, most most schools we see use Outlook, um, some moving to, um, you know, some other third party providers that, that have uh, email systems, you know, a couple I know of that are, are using Gmail for that purpose and sort of outsource it a little bit. Um, but, but as everybody likely knows, email is certainly a, a huge volume, it can become a huge volume of data and a, a treasure trove for investigators. And that would include government investigators as well as plaintiff's counsel. Um, Nothing they like more than to, to find out that you've kept every email that's been sent over the past decade, because once you start looking through that, um, you're probably, you'll probably be able to find something. Um, and, and so email is just a huge consideration. And the other form of, of, of electronic records that we see most often is database information. And that could be something like a, a Campus View um, or a Diamond D or one of those products. Uh, but it could also be an internal database that the school itself keeps, an access database or something like that. Um, and so, uh, so just be cognizant of those types of data. And the other type really is your hard copy, your hard copy forms. Um, you know, originals that have been signed by students that you keep in a, in a, uh, a safe place or in a, in a student file. Um, and, uh, and so those are really the two, two big data types as far as I can tell. And, and an additional explanation of types of data, your student information, your academic records, um, most often that's transcripts, um, but it could also be supporting information. You know, you may keep your instructor grade books for a period of time. You may keep actual tests that, that students took so that you could go back and maybe justify the, the grades that are on the transcript if it came to that. Um, but something to consider is, is what do you want your policy to be with regard to what your official record is? Is your official academic record what's on the transcript, or is it what's amongst that supporting do, that supporting supporting documentation? And and once you make that decision, which is typically a pretty easy one, and most people say, hey, what's on the transcript is is the it rules. It's it's number one. Um, you want to decide how long is it reasonable to keep that supporting documentation, and, and do you really need to keep it? Um, uh, your other other academic related information, your attendance data. Um, we've seen that as an increasing area of interest um, in the litigation context um, is, you know, there's a, a desire to know is, is attendance being falsified, um, are the attendance records accurate, and do those attendance records support the disbursement of, of Title IV funds that happen? And again, that can be a real, um, a, a, a real minefield for a school. Um, if if you keep your attendance records forever and, and they don't 
you know, something, something doesn't match up, what's in a hard copy attendance record doesn't match up with what's in the database, that, that creates some real problems for schools and that's been um, something we've seen in, in our practice certainly. And, and something to be cognizant of is, is doing some, some spot checking in real time to make sure that, that uh, what's in you know, a hard copy attendance record, for example, an instructor's attendance log, is going to match up with what's in the database. Um, another you know, common source of academic records is your externship related detail, your proof that, that your students did the hours they were supposed to do and got signed off on by their, by their uh, supervisor at that location. Um, typical other types of student information, your financial aid records, that includes your ledger cards, your ICERs, your verification information, your R2T4 calculations, um, and, and sort of all that goes along with, with uh, your financial aid disbursements, and then just other miscellaneous data that, that you may keep that you know, forms you have the student sign to acknowledge, um, you know, they've been notified about the campus uh, crime report, that they've received notice about uh, the school's policies regarding FERPA, all that just sort of miscellaneous stuff that, that we see all the time in student files and that's really, uh, don't, aren't necessarily consistent from institution to institution, but really every institution is keeping something other than just academic and financial aid records, it's in, in my experience anyway. Um, and then your, your other type of data is really your campus data. Those would be your policies and procedures, um, your, your memoranda that you might circulate to staff or that, that memorialize when certain things happen, when you did a policy update, when there was a change, for example, from the Department of Education and you want to notify everybody that, hey, uh, here's a change coming up and, and here's what the school's new policy is to make sure we're, we're keeping abreast of, of what we're required to do. Um, we see increasingly and in what we encourage clients to do is keep records of staff meetings and training events. Um, it's usually a good, a good practice, especially if you're given a compliance uh, uh, overview or a compliance review to, to have that proof in your file somewhere to make sure that, it, that, that you can demonstrate, hey, you know what, we have a commitment to compliance and the way we can evidence that um, is, is by showing you. Here's, here's our record of who attended and, a, and a, the topics we discussed that day. Um, and that can really be a, 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 great, um, a great resource uh, for the school to, to demonstrate that it's, it's doing the right thing and really working hard to, to keep its staff um, walking the straight and narrow and, and following internal policies and procedures and, and uh, changing those policies and procedures to remain updated with, with regulatory requirements. Uh, we also see a lot of schools uh, keeping receipts, which can be especially important for 9010 considerations. Obviously, that's a you know that's a, a critical component of of your Title IV compliance. And so, if you if you've got a um, a, a salon or a uh, you know a a, um, a clinic there on site, uh, and and you're going to use some of the the funds that are generated by that clinic um, to to help you meet your your ten requirement, you want to have those receipts kept and maintained so that you can prove that your calculation was accurate. Uh, typical other other. Uh, campus data, your network data, again, your, your standard documents that you use day to day, and your employee data, your email, your proof of their training and education, uh, proof of licenses and, con and continuing education, as well as their payroll and HR data. And I highlight those two um, as, as particularly important for your admission staff. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, quite a lot of interest from the Department of Education, uh, as well as um, enterprising uh, uh, plaintiffs in trying to make hay with claims that the school has violated the incentive compensation ban and uh, is, is paying its admission staff, uh, you know, its covered employees based on the department's guidance in violation of that prohibition. And so, uh, so uh, keeping your payroll and keeping track of, of when uh, uh, changes to salary were made and why in, in, an, in, a, in the context of HR data can be really a, a, a key component um, of, of what um, an investigator might be looking for and what a defense counsel might also be looking for to say, hey, you know what, uh, our people certainly didn't violate the regulation and here's the payroll that shows they didn't. Here's our evidence that, that these uh, salary adjustments were proper and, and not based on uh, uh, success in securing enrollment. And the other common campus data curriculum information on the academic side, um, that can include, you know, historical um, uh, curricula that have been developed for certain certain classes or, or programs um, and, and is updated on a regular basis consistent with your accrediting agency requirements. Um, what are some strategic considerations to keep in mind? Um, what's your ability to manage the volume of data you retain? 
And, and some questions you should ask yourself are, are uh, is the data accessible? Uh, that means, can you get to it? Um, and can you get to it effectively? Um, do you know uh, how it's saved um, and, and how to pull out you know, certain pieces of data you might need to have or you might need to get in a, in a, fairly, um, a, a, a fairly efficient manner? Um, and, and that flows directly into, is the data organized? Um, is, there, is there one person who kind of has an idiosyncratic way of saving things? And if, if that fella um, decides he's going to leave the organization and doesn't give you any notice, are you going to be left uh, up the creek uh, because it's just almost next to impossible to figure out how in the world was this stuff saved? Um, one, one thing that, that I've uh, tried to work on even at my firm is to come up with some standard naming conventions. If you have the same type of document that you're seeing again and again, try to find one way that you, that you name it and keep that consistent. Um, you know, try to organize stuff by year so that all of your 2013 information is, is kept in the, under the 2013 folder and it's broken out within there based on whether it's admissions related or, uh, or uh, a campus email or FA data um, and really as, as much of a, of, a, of a sort of an architecture as you can impose uh, on your on your file saving methodology uh, can can really help you be organized and, and be able to access that information in a in a streamlined fashion. And the other thing to consider is, um, even though you're keeping that data, can you use it efficiently? And and that sort of flows out of those accessibility and organization questions as well. Um, the other important strategic consideration uh, is cost. It's going to be your hardware and software, um, your IT infrastructure, inc including the the IT staff and um, costs associated with any third-party service providers that you need to get involved for data archiving or for data backup purposes. Um, some other strategic considerations. Um, uh, can this data be used as a sword against the institution? And, and um, so by that I mean, does the information evidence that a problem exists or used to exist? Um, and, and does that information you're keeping which you're not obligated to keep, allow a third party to use the school's own records for some negative purpose. And, and I want to be very clear in saying we're, we're certainly by no means um, urging anybody to go out and just start deleting stuff because it presents a problem. You need to assess whether or not, first of all, you, you, you're required to keep it. Um, and if you're not, um, you know, ask yourself why, why are we holding on to it and, and could it present a problem down the road? And the other strategic consideration is can the institution use the data it keeps effectively as a shield? Um, if, if uh, in the event you know, someone sues the school and, and claims it's engaged in this, that, and the other bad act, um, is, is the organization going to be able to use the data it has kept to show that, that no, in fact, it was compliant? And, and in what manner can it do so? And at what cost? And, and I think, um, you know, by and large, in my experience, it, it's far more often it's used as a sword effectively than a shield. Um, you can have uh, uh, 90, 100 documents and 99 of them show uh, uh, conscientious employees who are doing the right thing, who are working hard, who are abiding by the regulations. But when there's that one email out of the, nine, out of the 100 that shows a, a, an improper act or a bad act, that's the one that the government's going to seize on. That's the one the Plans Council is going to seize on to say, here, uh, this one shows that everything they did was probably wrong because we have this one instance of a, of a bad act in, in a written form. And um, so really um, the idea that, that really, hey, if we keep everything, it'll save us um, is a little bit of a, 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 I don't know, it can be a bit of a fool's errand um, because you just, as much good as you do, the one bad thing can often, is often seized upon and, and just used against you in a way that that even though you've done all this other great stuff, um, that amounts to very little in, in, in the eyes of many investigators. And, and the final strategic consideration is, is a common sense perspective. I mean, you can really just ask yourself on a, on a really practical level, um, why should the cool school keep this data? Is it, is it really um, useful to have email from 2005? And, you know, we have, I've had clients that have kept data back to the 90s. And you wonder, good gracious, um, is there ever, I mean, I don't know that I can ever conceive of a reason that I would need to see some, an email I wrote in 1998 uh, today in, in 2014. Um, you know, I guess, and, and if there is, 
uh, boy, I sure better have saved it in a, in a spot where I know what it is and where it is. Um, and if, if it's that important that I need to keep it, it really should be, uh, I should be able to, to validate and give a good reason why uh, I need to keep it. Um, does it make sense to keep that data? Um, it's a similar question as, as why should the schools keep it? Um, is it practical to do so? Again, getting back to, the, to, to clients that have kept data going back, you know, uh, uh, 20 years or more, um, it becomes really impractical oftentimes to keep it. Their, their network systems get bogged down, um, and, and uh, people spend a lot of time managing data that's so old that never gets used anyway. And it's sort of like, yeah, it sits out there um, like a, a, a rusting car uh, in someone's backyard that, that's, that's never even really used or being worked on or, or used to any constructive purpose. And, and ask yourself, um, what's the situation when it could help us? And is there any reasonable situation in which that can happen? Um, just kind of ask yourself those common sense questions and, and it may give you some, some pretty good insights into, hey, um, this is probably stuff we don't need to keep. This is stuff we've been holding on to that, that nobody uses. That, that good gosh, it's, it's, it's time to clean house and get rid of it. Um, with regard to your data detention and disruption policies, um, we're increasingly urging clients and counseling clients to implement those types of policies. Define how long you're going to keep this type of data, how long you're going to keep that type of data, and at what point will you be destroying data. Um, some clients certainly, um, even though there's a, there's a, a minimum requirement um, imposed by, for example, the Department of Education, that, that three years after the award in which the aid was awarded type of example, um, uh, they like to keep it a little bit longer than that just in case. So, but we still say, hey, you need to put uh, an expiration date on that stuff and make sure that you do get rid of it. Um, are the, and, and take a look at, uh, are those data retention and destruction policies consistent with the institution's regulatory and legal obligations? Think about what your accrediting agency requires, the Department of Education requires, what are your FERPA requirements for the way in which that data is stored? And, and what would happen if, uh, if a disgruntled IT employee walked off with a hard drive that, that contained student information going back 20 years with, with lots of addresses and social security numbers and things like that? It, it can really present a problem. Um, uh, and are those, are those uh, retention and destruction policies reasonable? Um, do they make sense? Can you justify it from a, a common sense perspective? And, and then are those policies actually put into practice and adhered to by staff? I think, uh, I think it's important to, to make it clear to your staff, particularly your IT staff, that this is a very important component of the way in which the institution operates. And if the policy is we keep it for uh, uh, five years, we're not keeping it for seven years or ten years or two years. Um, think of uh, two concepts that, that um, took me a while to kind of wrap my head around, that, they, that they're really different things, different animals, and that's data archiving versus data backup. And, and what's the difference? Um, generally speaking, um, your backup is, is what you use uh, for rapid recovery and what your current, your current uses and needs are. Um, if if uh, you know, there was a flood tomorrow and, and your uh, network servers got fried, um, you, need, you really need to get that back up as soon as you can so that you can keep your campus operating. You, know, you need campus view day to day, you need diamond view, view Diamond D day to day, you need your email day to day, and that's the sort of that's the that's the backup component. And archiving, in contrast, is really your repository of long-term data. And I think the best example of that is your academic information. Um, that's something that, that probably after a certain period of time, uh, you know, 10, 20 years, I don't know, can go into a data archive because it's unlikely you're going to need it uh, currently. Um, and and as long as you can still pull it up um, relatively easily. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a good thing to archive, and you haven't destroyed it, certainly, but you've gotten it off of your system and put it in an archive that you could access down the road should the need arise. And, and why do you need to keep these concepts separate? Um, speed of restoration is certainly a, a really important uh, topic, as we just discussed. Um, what are the, the software applications or, or, or hardware that allow for long-term retention and allow you to, to retain and archive that data um, sort of off of your current system? so that it's, it's not hogging up any space on, on uh, what you need um, in, the sh in the near term, the short term. Um, what's your search methodology within those two groups of data, your, your archive versus your backup? Um, you know, typically your backup is going to contain much more current information. 
you know, stuff that's from today going back, I don't know, you know, uh, five years, 10 years maybe. And, and your historical data in your archive could go back 20, 30, 40, you know, some clients that have been around for a long time have data going back to, you know, 1945. They've got their, they've got those academic transcripts from, from students that were in, in class back then. Um, media storage and life expectancy, you know, how long do you expect a typical hard drive to last? Do they eventually, they typically have moving parts and eventually those fail. And uh, so you need to think about um, how can you retain the data in a secure manner that's going to have some redundancy and is, is, uh, is unlikely to, to fail within the time that you may need to access it. Um, and what's your retention methodology? And then this is something that, that, that I've sort of um, know, you know, in, in a sense, just enough to be dangerous about um, when I talk to IT staff. And they love these sort of terms, you know, this data consolidation and deduplication. Um, if, if your director of admission sends in a weekly email to all of the admissions reps, that email is going to be in his sense. A copy of it is going to be in every one of those admissions reps' uh, inbox. And if they, if they file it into a folder of, you know, weekly uh, activity reports or, or, or weekly updates or something like that, it could also exist in another folder. So really, um, you know, do you need um, uh, 20 different copies of an email that goes out every single week? You know, that, that, that volume of data quickly adds up. And if you can engage in some deduplication, it can really save you a lot of space, a lot of time and effort. Um, what kind of requests for data are we seeing? Um, well, the government, typically the Department of Education, it's OIG or the DOJ, uh, their requests, when they start out, they're typically not very narrowly tailored. Um, they're going to want everything, they're going to ask for everything, and they're going to also want the kitchen sink. So um, one thing to consider is if you kept it all, you may well be obligated to turn it all over. And certainly you can um, do your best, uh, based on the advice of your legal counsel, to narrow those requests and say, hey, you know what, um, we, don't, we think it's an undue burden to provide uh, uh, every single payroll record for every single employee for a 10-year period. Um, but uh, if you kept it all, a judge may say, well, you have it, so if they want to look at it, you've know, you you got to let them do so. And so um, if you keep everything, as I said, you got to turn it over. So that's something to consider. And of course, uh, anybody watching the news lately, um, seeing increasing action by the state attorneys general and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in this area. And, um, and, and those groups, again, uh, much like your other investigators, like nothing more than a group that, that the institution that was a pack rat and, and kept everything. Because um, who knows what you may find once you start looking. And you might have requests for data from your regulatory entities, although in my experience and what I've seen is, is they tend to be more on top of it um, in terms of not wanting to look back a long way. They tend, their requests tend to issue more real time. Um, but it's another area that, that where you might need to provide some data. But again, um, it's typically not, um, they're not looking for, for everything going back uh, decades. And, and your proper data destruction policy, it's going to limit the data you have to produce. And that's going to limit your internal costs. And that's in terms of your costs, not only of, of keeping the data and maintaining it, but also of producing and providing it to the other side. It can prevent a phishing expedition from occurring, which is, uh, you know, a, a plaintiff's counsel who says, well, I know if I keep looking long enough, I'm going to find something. Um, and that's really something you want to avoid. It, it, it really um, leads to a lot of uncertainty and a lot of legal costs that, that you can prevent um, if, if the, the data set you've got is more limited. And it can really insulate uh, the institution from, from effectively creating liabilities where, where none might otherwise exist. Um, you know, if, if the department requires you to keep things for three years and you kept them for 10, they may well look back and, and see what you were doing uh, eight years ago. Uh, five years ago, something like that. Whereas if you don't have the data, your, your answer is easy. We don't have it. And we're obligated to keep it. Our data, our data destruction policy said we kept it for this long. After that, it's gone. We don't have it anymore. So some and maybe many of you in your institutions have had firsthand experience with litigation and, and litigation hold. Um, in my personal experience practicing in, in this area, um, I found that they often are most relevant in employment law context and um, more often now the regulatory law context. 
Uh, those of you who haven't had uh, such experience should count themselves lucky. Um, but um, I'm not going to assume that everybody has had uh, or been involved with litigation. So what does a litigation hold? Uh, very simply put, it's the obligation to retain documents for litigation slash lawsuit purposes. So um, in lawyer speak, it, it's document preservation for discovery purposes. And uh, when you're involved in a lawsuit, uh, the term discovery basically refers to the exchange of documentation and information between the two parties. And that's done in a variety of different ways. It's also governed by uh, certain rules of civil procedure or criminal procedure, depending on the context, uh, in both state and federal contexts. And uh, there's also uh, quite a bit of case law authority that, that governs uh, what is required. Why, it, why are litigation holds important? Well, to be frank, they can make and break your case. Uh, it is quite possible that um, a party can win or lose an entire case based on how they treat and approach and manage uh, litigation holds. Um, you, there, there's several, there, there can be some downsides, things that you don't want. If you don't do a proper litigation hold, um, you may be accused of what's called spoilation, uh, essentially a term of art used uh, uh, for improperly destroying documents. Um, those kinds of accusations could cause a judge to uh, instruct a jury to make an adverse inference. Um, that because certain certain documentation was destroyed, that the facts that would be, it would go to prove are in fact uh, are in fact true. Um, you you want to have a good litigation hold strategy uh, to avoid um, sometimes monetary sanctions that are imposed on parties if they don't do so properly. Uh, one of those can also be having to pay the other side's attorney's fees. Um, I find that most people don't want to pay their own attorney's fees, much less the other side's attorney's fees. So it's important to have a good litigation hold. Um, some of the key elements of a litigation hold, relevant custodians, uh, we're going to deal, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more on the next slide as well, that it, you ought to know that not all information is relevant to any given case, and that may be an obvious thing to state. But um, it's important to identify the universe of sources that relevant information is located. Um, you, uh, IT department considerations, some institutions have a very robust in-house IT department. Others don't. Um, some, you know, you may have, you know, dozens, employee, dozens of employees in yours. You may have, it may be a, a, a one man or woman show. And it's important uh, that your IT, that you have um, a dialogue with your IT department to know how and where and in what manner all information is stored and how that information can and should be secured and how, if at all, it can be retrieved in the event that it needs to be retrieved. Uh, some, some schools have, uh, instead of having their own in-house IT, or in addition to their in-house IT, they have third-party hosted environments and processes where they have their information stored. Um, what I'll say in this regard is, is I think an institution needs to think about their information in terms of dollar signs in a certain sense. Uh, you want to have, if you're, if you're going to invest your money, if you're going to put your money in a bank, you want to put it in one that you trust, uh, that you have a good relationship with, and uh, where those persons who work for that particular entity uh, are responsive to your needs if and when you find yourself in litigation and need to identify, secure, and produce uh, any information that is stored electronically. Privilege considerations, this relates to uh, not everything uh, that may be kept and uh, produced is subject to disclosure. 
particularly you'll find the two main areas are attorney-client communications and um, anything that may be considered work product. And that determination would most likely be made by, uh, by the school's counsel. So going back to places where uh, identifying places where relevant information may be found, um, what we've found in the in the higher education context is that data is mostly found and sought from the following uh, following key departments, those being human resources, financial aid, uh, the admissions department, the registrar, and uh, in instances where there's a compliance department or a compliance officer um, in that area. Um, it's important institution-wise uh, I think to have a, a clearly delineated policy procedure and plan whereby uh, all of these departments um, are on the same page and doing the same thing uh, so that when, if and when litigation does arise, um, things can be, can be, you know what you have and things can be sought and found quickly and easily. Um, the potential impact of an unreasonable and or inadequate, inadequate litigation holds that I touched on earlier. Um, that, that would include allegations of spoilation from the opposing party, could be monetary san sanctions, and again, it could be the judge uh, making uh, or instructing the jury to make an adverse inference uh, against you. And I'll quickly provide you some of uh, uh, some case law examples um, in the Southern District of New York, <clears throat> the court imposes the following, when litigation is reasonably foreseeable, the parties must begin by instituting a litigation hold and make certain that all sources of potentially relevant information are identified and placed on hold. To do so, counsel must become fully familiar with the client's document retention policies as well as client's data retention architecture. You'll see that you know the the verbiage in a lot of this reasonably foreseeable um, data retention architecture. Uh, there there's a lot that's subject to interpretation, which uh, which you know that's just part of the business. In which case you have you you have to uh, you have to really pay attention to the jurisdiction that you're into. Um, in the Zablocki case, the court also stated that. This will invari invariably evolve what I spoke about earlier, uh, knowing your inf information technology personnel who can explain system-wide backup procedures and actual implementation of, of the institution's policy. Um, in the Southern District of Illinois, to give you a little bit more uh, of lack of specificity, the, the court requires that the duty, preserve, the duty to preserve arises when litigation is imminent. Um, again, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis um, and really depending on the court, not only the court, but particular judge that you're in front of, what they perceive, perceive to be imminent. Finally, the duty to hold applies when an organization is on notice of a credible probability that will become, invo that will become involved with litigation seriously contemplates initiating litigation or when it takes specific action to commence litigation. And that's from the Sedona Conference in 2010. It's, it's probably the most catch-all broad uh, definition that I've seen that when in doubt, uh, don't press the delete button. What are we seeing more and more uh, in terms of on the litigation context? Uh, False Claims Act or FCA claims? Um, Again, your discovery obligations fall into your, your obligation to retain documents, um, your obligation to produce documents, and your obligation or your desire to review those documents before they get produced. Um, and, and FCA claims can have um, some huge costs associated with it. And then some of those costs are, are involved in your data identification and collection. Um, so what you may end up doing is, is working with, with opposing counsel or, or with an investigator to define some keyword search terms. And, and if you're doing that, and, and what you'll have is your IT people will run those terms against your data 
and anything that, that, that hits on one of those terms is considered to be relevant or potentially relevant. And, and when you're choosing those keyword search terms, you really want to pay attention to, to the words that you choose. Um, admission, for example, um, if, if your admissions representatives have uh, a, a signature line that says, um, Ben Walker, admissions representative, and here's my email, then every single email they sent is going to hit on that a keyword search term admission. Um, and so you're going to hit on a ton. I mean, you'd be amazed at the volume of data you'd produce that is completely irrelevant to anything. It hit on a keyword search term, but it's got nothing to do with, with the litigation at all. And some other ones, you know, pay or evaluate, a couple of other examples that, that, that can hit, but um, uh, uh, often produce uh, 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 useless information and useless results. Um, other big costs are data processing, and so that means once you've gotten your data um, compiled and, and pulled together, you've got to typically put it into a database to have it reviewed. That involves data processing to pull out the, the redundant information, the duplicated information, things like that. That's running these days about $200 to $250 per gigabyte. Um, and you know, once those gigabytes start adding up, that can really be a huge cost because that cost is just on the front end, just to get it into, into a, uh, a database so it can be reviewed. Um, then you're going to typically need to render that data searchable. Um, in terms of uh, running an optical character recognition system, an OCR, uh, so, that, so that the other side and you will be able to run a text search on it. Um, once it's in your database, typically your, your, your counsel, maybe he'll let you participate um, if, if counsel's amenable to it, you know, that's going to depend on the situation. They're going to be looking for typically relevance and privilege, and you hope to avoid the relevance by having good keyword search terms so that you're really not collecting a lot of useless information. And then you're just your, your cost associated with actually producing the data to the other side. Um, that's probably the least of those, and, and I would say the most, the, the, the highest cost is, is in your data review, um, your processing and rendering the data searchable. Um, to, to finish out, some suggested do's and don'ts. Um, on the do side, retain data that's necessary. Um, um, keep it for the period required and, and don't, um, don't keep it you know, a whole lot longer than that unless you need to. Um, confer with your managers to assess their retention uh, needs or your obligations to keep the data. You know, there, maybe there's a, good, a very good reason to keep data beyond the period that, that's provided for in the regulation. And, and that can be, you know, your manager are going to know the stuff, the data, and then they may have some good input on that. Um, we suggest you do institute a document destruction policy, establish some timelines when data will be destroyed and follow through on it, and then consult with your counsel or your IT staff about, about your policy. Um, Otherwise, you end up with, with cases where, um, you know, as, as we've we found, um, plaintiffs are, are requesting data going back a decade, and you're, you're coming up with hundreds of gigabytes of, of potentially responsive information, and the cost just becomes uh, staggering very quickly. Um, and again, as I, as I alluded to earlier, if you kept it all, you kind of have to look at it all, and that becomes a, a problem. And your don'ts, don't retain everything just in case. Um, it's 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 the, the rare the rare time when we found oh boy it sure is great that they kept this data going back 10 years because because now we have we hit the jackpot and this showed they were doing everything right um, typically the opposite is true um, don't allow individual users or departments to implement idiosyncratic document retention or destruction procedures um, you know that can be a big problem on that spoilation side um, if data was supposed to be kept but but you didn't uh, let your um, you didn't have a, a data an email archiving system in place, for example, or you left it up to staff to to keep the data and, and trusted they would do it, and they really didn't follow through on that. And instead, they ran roughshod and, and and engaged in some mass deletion that can really present some problems. Uh, don't fail to, to conduct a review of the data you're retaining and your underlying retention methodology. You've got to look at that to make sure that, that what you're keeping meets your needs and and is going to allow you to, to use it effectively going forward. And, and don't ignore engaging in a, in a cost-benefit analysis to determine the effectiveness and reasonableness of, of your initial policy determination. Um, doing that, that look back can be a, a, a real benefit to the organization and, and can really help uh, limit your cost, but, but still ensure you're, you're maintaining your compliance. At um, this point, um, we're going to finish out the, the webinar, and uh, if you have any questions, um, please uh, submit those, and we'll um, we'll do our best to answer them. Great. Um, so 
it looks like we have one or two questions, um, but we still have a couple more minutes. So if you do have uh, questions, please go ahead and submit them. Um, the first question is, if there is no specific legal guidance on how long to maintain a certain type of document, what is the best practice for best practice for determining the length of time to maintain this data? Well, I think um, it's a great question. Um, I think something to think about is, is to look at it, uh, what's reasonable. Um, is it similar to another type of document that you have to keep for a prescribed period? And it would be reasonable to say, hey, because this is like that other type of document, we're going to keep it for the same period of time. Um, I think, again, a, a little common sense um, perspective on it can, can go a long way. Um, and, and can really help you um, in, in making that determination. Um, you know, what, what makes sense from sort of a, a reasonableness perspective? Um, if, if you had a judge saying, hey, um, why did you keep this stuff for this period of time? Would you be able to say, you know what, Your Honor, the reason we kept it is for these reasons, because it's similar to this type of data, so we kept it for that period of time. Or is the answer, you know what, um, no one said we had to keep it. We felt it was reasonable to keep it for six months, and, and because um, nobody ever tended to need it after that period of time. We went ahead and destroyed it. Um, it was um, it was reasonable to do so in our view because if we kept it much longer, it would have started clogging up our systems. It would have required a lot of effort to get it archived and backed up properly. And really, what we found was that no one ever needed it after that period of time. And um, so, if there's no specific prescription, you know, it's really um, you're really a little bit in the wild west. Um, in terms of it being left up to the organization, but I think that as long as you can you can justify it um, from a, from that sort of reasonableness or, or um, uh, sort of a common sense uh, perspective, that that can give you a really good insight into how long you ought to keep something. And and again, um, I, I don't I don't think it'd be a very good argument for for an investigator uh, to say or, or or a government official to say, hey, um, we don't prescribe. Uh, how long you have to keep this, and because you didn't keep it for as long as we in our heads think you should have, um, that's a problem. I, I think that'd be a pretty unavailing argument, and and you could really your counsel, your defense counsel, could really make some hay against someone who's trying to impose uh, a certain requirement that really doesn't exist in any regulation or law. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, do you are you aware of any chart or table that shows Sorry, my uh, <laughs> question box just disappeared. Um, are you aware of any table that shows the legal required document retention and suggested retention policies? Um, something that you know in one place. Sure, I haven't seen a really good um, document like that, other than one that I kind of made had made for some clients because they asked me to. Um, and if you email me, um, I can I can um, send you what I've got. Now it wouldn't uh, take me long to pull it out of my little data archive and 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 provide it to you. Um, but um, but I I did that mostly based on the FSA handbook. Again, it's a, it's a pretty good uh, pretty good resource in terms of giving you some guidance on that, and it does a pretty good job of defining what you need to keep and how long you need to keep it. Um, and and in terms of um, the, the really idiosyncratic thing is, is the accreditation agency requirements because those just vary um, from agency to agency. You may see some general similarities in terms of what you need to keep them for how long, but typically they've, they've got their own requirements and you've got to abide by those too. But in terms of Department of Education requirements, um, if, 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 uh, if one of the attendees needs it or wants it, uh, shoot me an email and I will um, will do my best to get that out to you. It's not a chart form, but it's certainly a nice little list that the, that the client um, who was um, was was uh, work on this issue uh, had asked me to to create for them and, and I'll be happy to provide it to you. Great. And um, what I didn't mention earlier is Ashi and Ben will be writing an article for Career Education Review um, later in the month, the next month, um, and maybe that table or that list would be good to put in that article for our subscribers. Sure. Yep, but if anybody needs it in the interim, like I said, um, uh, this is Ben. You be, uh, feel free to email me, and I'll do my best to get back to, uh, get it out to you as soon as I can. But that's a, that's a very good point, Jenny, and we'll uh, we'll certainly uh, include that. And then uh, just to add, in instances where you're you need to know something beyond what 
located in, in uh, written rules and regulations and accreditation standards, uh, it, it is a hairy thing to try to figure out what jurisdiction you may find yourself in in litigation and what what judges have ruled in those areas and it it's uh, it may require uh, legal identification review and analysis of case law for that particular jurisdiction and that may vary and then that's but that's something that you really can't I, I wouldn't engage in crystal ball gazing in the event litigation does happen what will we what, what do we wish we had done I think once it once you're on notice um, that's when you need to be checking that case law and figuring out what your, your obligation is, because otherwise you may be again creating a problem um, before before you really need to be addressing the issue. What you want to ask yourself is, uh, you know, what sort of explanation would you have for keeping something or destroying something? And if you have a reasonable, uh, explainable explanation, that is almost the best it is that you can do. Well, great. Um, with that, I think we will uh, end the webinar. One final thing. Um, there was a question if the PowerPoint will be forwarded to the attendees. Um, I will actually put the PDF of the PowerPoint up on the CER website, and I will send you a link to the PDF on the website. Um, and that should go out tomorrow morning. Um, I want to thank Ben and Ashi for taking the time today to speak with us, um, and we will keep you updated with further webinars. Um, if you do have a topic idea, please feel free to email it to me, um, and I'll pass it on to them, and we will turn that into a webinar. So with that said, um, again, I want to thank Ashi and Ben. Um, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks very much, Jenny. Have a good afternoon to all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you.